secret. Walter was uh, was and is brilliant, was a wonderful graduate student, and I'm really proud that in his retirement, he's taking on some really important tasks that he doesn't have to. He's volunteering to do this work. And I also want to thank Tom and Jim. Uh, Tom gave me a great briefing on the situation in New Mexico with respect to hydrogen. And Jim, thanks for making all the arrangements. So great. let me get started. Tony, if I might interrupt, uh, for the audience, if you have questions as we go on um, and uh, for the Q&A, just go ahead and type them into the chat uh, as, the, uh, as the talk proceeds, and then we'll review those and, uh, and kind of uh, go through them and, and ask um, Tony and Grafia to respond. Thank you. Okay, Sorry, good. So given the abject seriousness of the topic tonight, I thought I'd start with just a little bit of humor so that we don't get depressed too early. It's my favorite joke. I have to annotate it every once in a while. If you don't get the New Yorker magazine, you should because the cartoons are always topical. Um, okay, so here's what we're gonna do tonight. I anticipated and based on what Tom and, and Jim told me that there's gonna be a wide range of knowledge among you concerning methane and its importance. So I'm gonna very quickly hit three topics um, about methane, also known as CH4. I'd rather call it fossil gas, but I wanna talk about its role in three things. First and most importantly, climate change. And as you probably all know, Methane is a major driver of climate change, and I'll support that with a few slides. Then we'll move into the second subtopic, the role of methane in the ongoing green energy transition, where it has been a major impediment to that transition and continues to be a major impediment. Then I'll conclude with the geopolitical cudgel. Uh, what role does methane play right now, immediately? in geopolitics, and boy, is that a mess. So those are the three topics we'll hit on very quickly. I'm looking forward to, to the Q&A to follow up on the brief comments I'm going to give. So let's start with methane as a climate change driver. I've been tracking this chart since about 2006. It's a graph that shows on the horizontal axis the year and the vertical axis the concentration of methane in the Earth's atmosphere as measured by NOAA. And you'll notice that the methane concentration is increasing since about 2004, and it's increasing at an increasing rate. And there's been a lot of science done on why that is. And the best available science now says that about half of this increase is due to oil and gas operations worldwide. So, what does this have to do with climate change? So there's methane in the atmosphere. There's always been methane in the atmosphere. Why is it important now? It's important now from a political point of view because finally, finally, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says it's important. It took them to their sixth assessment report, which as you know, came out late last year and early this year, for them to say, wow, methane is really important. Uh, and we confirm that in the short run, over the next 20 years, the warming potential, the global warming potential of methane relative to carbon dioxide is about 87. So one kilogram of methane in the atmosphere is equivalent to 87 kilograms of CO2. So a very small concentration of methane is really important. I'm glad the IPC finally confirmed that. I wish they had said it 10 years ago. So now we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into this question of how is methane a driver for climate change? Because IPC says so, because the Clean Air Task Force says so. And by the way, Dave McCabe of the Clean Air Class Task Force will name, his name will come up again in a few slides. He was a strong critic of all the work I did 10 years ago on methane. 
others have come in and said methane is very important. And of course, when you finally hear the New York Times say that it's important, I guess it's important. Halting the vast release of methane is critical for climate. Why? <clears throat> I'm going to spend a good three or four minutes on this slide because it's really important. Once again, it's a graph, it's a chart. The horizontal axis is again year, starting from the year 1900 up to the year 2070. The vertical axis is a measure of global warming in degrees centigrade relative to what? Warm relative to what? Well, it's warm relative to the average global temperature over a 20 year period between 1890 and 1910. That's the assumed zero. In other words, they're, they're neglecting any warming that occurred before 1890. All right, so who made this chart? Uh, a professor at Duke University named Drew Sindel, working with about 20 other climate scientists around the world made this chart in 2010 and emphasize 11 years ago, 12 years ago, and they published it in 2012, 10 years ago. What's in the chart? This black squiggly line is measured data. It's measured global warming. Remember they said, let's assume zero is 1890 to 1910, that's at the left end. And as you can see, it's up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. And by the time we get to about 2010, it's about a seven tenths degree centigrade global warming. That's where we were 2010. So when they wrote this paper, they had done what Walter and I are familiar with doing. They did computer simulations to try to project, to forecast forward in time what kind of global warming we can anticipate in the future, that is past 2010. And they created four scenarios. One scenario is the purple line. So each one of these solid lines is the result of a computer simulation, a forecast of the future. The purple line is what they call the reference case. And they assume there that we do nothing the world does nothing about emissions of greenhouse gases going forward from 2010. And what that computer simulation predicted is that we would get to 1.5 degrees centigrade in 2029 on average, because these are computer simulations, they're not exact. There's an error involved and the error is this vertical purple line so just like you forecast hurricanes, you have this triangle where they say, well, the hurricane path is liable to be somewhere in this triangle. The, the most probable is right down the middle, but it could also be up here. It could also be down here. So they were predicting back in 2009, we might get to 1.5 degrees centigrade by 2022. Or we might not get there until 2043. That was one case. The other extreme was what happens if in 2010, the world got together and said, we need to drastically reduce emissions of the three principal anthropogenic greenhouse drivers, carbon dioxide, methane, and black carbon. Black carbon is soot. And that's this light green line. And they said by computer simulation in 2010, if we were to get on that line and drastically reduce CO2, methane, and soot, the most probable outcome is that we wouldn't get to 1.5 to degrees centigrade until the mid 2040s. And you know what? We might not ever get to two degrees centigrade. All right, well, so what's so important here? This is from 10 years ago. Why should I care? We only care about computer simulations if they can be validated, proven to be true. 
Otherwise, they're just another coin toss. So what's happened since 2010? We have 12 more measurements of global warming. Here they are, the red dots. For each year past 2010, I plotted the data from NASA as a red dot. And once again, you see the temperature goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. And now I ask you, which one of these curves are we following? The worst one. The worst one. Yes. So we're on the path to getting to 1.5 degrees centigrade somewhere around the year 2030. And as I said before, finally, the IPCC in the last four months said this. The central estimate of crossing the 1.5 degree centigrade global warming threshold occurs in the early 2030s, 10 years earlier than the likely range we assessed just one year ago. Emphasizing the point they made that global warming is accelerating. So what does this have to do with methane? If you want to slow down global warming, if you were to cut out all carbon dioxide emissions, nothing happens for the next 18 years. If you were to zero out carbon dioxide emissions, all the carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere will keep us on the path to 1.5 degrees. And will get us to two degrees in about 2042. But if you were to cut down carbon dioxide and methane, you'd be traveling along this green path. And the reason why is that methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas that has a relatively short lifetime in the atmosphere, only about 12 years half-life. But during that time, it is the last remaining valve, the last remaining rheostat, the last remaining switch, the last remaining dial that we can turn down to affect a slowdown in global warming. That's what the IPCC finally said. If we don't cut down methane emissions as soon as possible, we are on one of these other paths, the purple one or the red one. And we're doomed to get to two degrees centigrade well before 2050. As I said, none of this is really conducive to laughing at this point. All right, so how long have we known this? Most climate scientists have known it, but conservatively didn't want to scare the public or scare the politicians. So when Bob Howarth, my colleague at Cornell, and Renee Santoro, another colleague at Cornell, wrote our paper in 2011, we said, we really need to cut back on methane emissions. And most of those new methane emissions that are driving that methane concentration up in the atmosphere are coming from shale gas and oil operations. And 11 years ago, we wrote a paper that was said, we think that the emission rate of methane from shale gas and oil operations in the United States is somewhere between 3.6 and 7.9% of total production. We went out on a limb with very little data, but with a very good understanding <laughs> of how the industry operates, because I have been working with the oil and gas industry since 1978. I was one of their wonder kids. I was helping them figure out how to do hydraulic fracturing. I admit it, I was the enemy. So there we were making a bold prediction 12 years ago, 11 years ago, 3.6 to 7.9% of production is exhausted in the atmosphere unburned but we were saying the right thing at the wrong time. Because at that time, all the big NGOs, I won't mention their names, you know who I'm talking about, had this meme going about bridge fuel. Natural gas is the bridge fuel to a green, sustainable future. And President Obama 
in his 2011 State of the Union address said, quote, we have a supply of natural gas that can last America 100 years. Bragging about it. And so the White House, the White House, Secretary Chu, Secretary of Energy, Nobel Prize winner, went public the year after we published our paper. And at an oil and gas conference where he was invited to give the keynote speech, said that our paper was not credible. Couldn't possibly be 3.6 to 7.9%, impossible. We're way overestimating fugitive emissions. No, we weren't. We were unluckily correct. We're sorry we were correct, but we were also conservative. So since 2011, there have been 150 papers published around the world on methane emission measurements. And the vast majority of them fall between 3.6 and 7.9%. And as you well know, the most recent one <laughs> coming out of a group at Stanford, which studied emissions in the New Mexico Permian, 9.4%. And six months before that, coming out of the Uinta Basin in Utah, 6 to 8%. These papers are bombshells to all but a few. They won't be a bombshell to you anymore. And the key point, the key point in this paper from Stanford is, is not so much the 9.4%. They're pushing back on the long-term major study that the Environmental Defense Fund did in collaboration with the industry over a period of nearly eight years and 20 referee publications in which they concluded that only about 2.3% of total production was getting into the atmosphere unburned. And everybody jumped on that, including the Biden administration. It's only 2.3%, EDF says so. But this is a quote. That quote is from the Stanford paper. The fact that our large sample size was required to characterize the heavy tail of the distribution emphasizes the importance of capturing low probability, high consequence events through basin-wide surveys when estimating regional oil and gas methane emissions. That is a slap in the face, a kick in the butt to the EDF work. They effectively are saying the EDF work was nonsense. They sampled so few wells over short, so short a period of time, they could not have possibly captured the statistical distribution correctly. So it's not 3.6% nationally. It's probably not 9.4% nationally, but it sure as hell ain't 2.8%. And outside the US, in the Middle East and Russia, where quote, there are no tough regulations, I'll let you imagine what the, really, what the emission rate is. So I'm gonna take two minutes for those of you who don't really understand where the methane is coming from. Where, how does the methane go from oil and gas operations into the atmosphere? So I'm gonna show a couple of videos. I won't take too much time. Um, First, I'll show one which is a huge emission of a point source. I hope these videos come through. Are you seeing that okay? Yes, yes. That's a blowdown from a huge, of a, a large transmission gas pipeline. Pipeline was under repair. All pipelines get repaired. All pipelines get inspected. Every time you repair a pipeline or inspect a pipeline, you blow down all the methane that's stored in the pipeline. High pressure, large release. 
There are many sources. I'm just going to show a couple. Compressor station, mandatory yearly blowdown, or accidental blowdown due to overpressurization or failure of a component. These last for days. Or you have the slow, steady stuff that the Stanford study showed. What are 68,000 wells I think they looked at? This is a wellhead in Pennsylvania. The gas is supposed to be come out, coming out inside that pipe. It's coming out inside the pipe, but it's also coming out outside the pipe. That's a perfect example of a leaking well. My estimate is that there are at least 100,000 wells like that leaking in the United States right now. And many hundreds of thousands around the world. So in case somebody says, well, where's the methane coming from? There's some examples. All right, let's move along. Second major topic, the energy transition. Why has it been delayed by methane? It's been delayed by natural gas. It's been delayed because we tapped into shale gas and shale oil at the worst possible time. We were in a transition away from fossil fuels. And then the industry discovered how to get oil and gas out of shale. Last remaining major resource on earth, a huge resource. Figured out how to do it roughly 20 years, 25 years ago. And they've been on the path of increasing it every year since. So here's what happened to our green renewable energy transition. This is the history of wind energy capacity in the electricity sector of the United States starting in the year 2000. Again, year in a horizontal axis, vertical axis, is total installed wind energy capacity in megawatts. And as you can see from about 2000 up until about 2008, we were on an exponential increasing path. And then kink, 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 flat, kink, up, down, up, alternating periods of high exponential growth and slow linear growth, sending a very strong market message. What's the market message? People don't want to invest in fragile investments, investments that are likely to be at the whim of something else, insecure, unpredictable. Money doesn't go in unpredictable directions from Wall Street. It was much safer to put the money down a hole to get oil and gas out of it than to put it in a wind turbine. There's proof. Exponential growth, linear growth. What did we lose? So I replotted that same data. Here is the exponential curve that we fit to the data up until about 2008, 2009. That's the path we were on until various regulations, rules came into play. Reduction of federal government subsidies, redirection of capital into the shale gas explosion away from renewable energy. This is where we should have been in the year 2022. This is where we are. My estimate is we lost 500 gigawatts of capacity because natural gas prices were very low. You wanna run, you wanna generate electricity, kill coal, bring in a coal fire, a gas fired power plant. We don't need wind. We don't need solar. Same story in solar. This is the history of the US solar energy capacity. Here it is, energy capacity year, Again, alternating periods of high exponential growth and slow linear growth. Exponential to here, linear, 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 linear. Same story. By the end of this decade, we should have been about here. We're gonna be about here if we continue along the same path we're on. We lost about 170 gigawatts through that oscillation because of politics and economics. 
brought on by cheap natural gas. This is the topic that's going to drive me nuts because it's changing by the hour. Methane as a geopolitical cudgel. Who's wielding the cudgel right now? Not him. This is Rex Tillerson when he was the CEO of Exxon back in 2011. He's given a speech at the annual meeting of the Oil Council. The Oil Council is a meeting where all the major oil and gas companies send their CEOs to discuss how they're going to decide our future. And in his keynote speech in 2011, he said, shale won't last. Arctic drilling is needed now. Where do you do Arctic drilling? Who owns most of the Arctic? Recognize anybody in this picture? So here's Rex Tillerson with Vladimir Putin, some unknown guy, and Igor Sechin. If you read Blowout by Rachel Maddow, you'll read all about these guys. <laughs> These are the wheeler and dealers of the oil and gas industry in Russia. So what do you think Rex Tillerson was doing in Russia in 2011, 2012? Cutting deals. This is a quote. Russia contributes significantly to ensuring global and regional energy security. So says the man who five years later become Secretary of State. Exxon signed a joint agreement with Russia for $500 billion worth of investment in the Arctic. These are Arctic locations and the Black Sea. Think Crimea, think Mariupol. Told you it was ugly. So now we have a new meme. First it was natural gas is the bridge fuel to a green renewable energy future for the United States. Now it's natural gas through fracking is a powerful weapon against Russia. It's not Fox News saying this. I should say it's not only Fox News saying this. Here's Jennifer Granholm, Obama's Secretary of Energy. Drill baby drill. She called on US oil producers to increase their output, urging them to get their rig counts up. Drill baby drill. That was a month ago, right after the invasion. This is three days ago. Granholm said the Biden administration has pressed domestic oil producers to increase supply and that there is a response by the oil and gas market. Granholm said the government told American energy companies to increase production where and whenever they can right now. The U.S. was going to do its utmost to offer liquefied natural gas, LNG, to countries seeking to wean themselves off Russian supplies. We are exporting every molecule of natural gas that can be liquefied at a terminal that exists. So clearly there's a trade-off going on here. Do we forego the fight against climate change to help win the petroleum war in Ukraine? Must we? aid the Ukrainians and the Russians by foregoing our fight against climate change? No. But that's the easy way to do it from the oil and gas industry point of view, and it's the most profitable way to do it. You and I, not I, because we don't have gas in our, in our house. We don't use natural gas in our house. 
But Americans right now are paying roughly four times more to heat their homes than they were last year because the price of natural gas is going up by a factor of four. The people in Europe who want to heat their homes next, next winter with liquefied natural gas in the US, <laughs> you know how much that's going to cost them? You know how much profit there is in exporting natural gas to Europe? And what happens to methane emissions? Going back to my first topic, methane is a driver of climate change. If you now liquefy natural gas coming out of the Permian and coming out of the Marcellus, and you put it on cryogenic tankers and you ship it to Europe, not only do you have the 3.6 to 7.9% leakage rate inside the United States, you get an additional 10% leakage rate while it's being shipped as natural gas, as liquefied natural gas. Because you have to pipeline it to a terminal, you have to liquefy it, you have to put it in a cryogenic tanker, you have to go across the ocean, you have to regasify it and put it in another pipeline. Those are all very energy intensive actions and they all involve additional leakage. I did a quick calculation based on the 28 billion cubic meters of liquefied natural gas we sent to Europe last year. We put another 230 million additional kilograms of methane into the atmosphere over and above what would have gone in had we used that natural gas in the US. It's a surcharge. It's a methane surcharge. Bad. Remember Obama in 2011, State of the Union address said, we have 100 years of natural gas. No, we don't. This is data from the Department of Energy, Energy Information Administration. The United States proved reserves. A proved reserve is a quantity of oil or gas that is technologically and economically viable for production. At the rate at which we're consuming oil, 7 billion barrels per year, we have about a five year supply left. At a rate at which we're consuming natural gas in the US, 33 trillion cubic feet per year, we have about a 15 year supply left. But neither of those supplies include exports. The more we export, the less we have at home. So we're burning our candle at both ends. We're burning the 7 billion gallons of oil and the 33 trillion cubic feet of natural gas here, but we're also exporting oil and natural gas for profit and allegedly to aid our allies in their time of need over there. So what's this doing to our US energy security? From a fossil fuel point of view, it's, it's gonna all be over pretty soon. The problem is that that pretty soon is in that same time domain between now and the year 2030, when climate change is gonna bite us in the butt. So what should we be doing for our European allies? My opinion is we accelerate what, they're all, what they have already been doing. The Europeans by and large have been far ahead of us in the energy transition, the green energy transition. We have to accelerate that, help them to accelerate it by decreasing their demand for Russian natural gas and increasing their supply of green renewable energy. And the US can help them do both with exports other than gas and oil. That's what we should be doing. So let me summarize here. So we have plenty of time for Q&A. Three points I made about methane. The only way we can now slow down climate change, slow down global warming, is not by drastically reducing carbon dioxide only. We have to do that. But that alone won't slow things down. 
we have to simultaneously and to the same level decrease methane emissions. In production of oil and gas from shale formations in the Permian and the Marcellus leads to the burning of those fossil fuels as carbon producing carbon dioxide and the emission of methane as a greenhouse gas. Obviously, the second point is the oil and gas industry is pulling out all the stops to stay alive. Hydrogen, hydrogen, Ukraine, Ukraine. And the obvious thing is, if you want true energy independence for every country on earth, you recognize that nobody owns the infinite supply of sunlight, the infinite supply of wind, and the infinite supply of falling water. Those resources are owned by every country in their own domain. And if that's what they're using for their energy production, those supplies are free. Nobody owns them. You can't weaponize the wind. You can't weaponize the sun. So we have to do everything we can starting at home and then helping our European allies and everybody else who wants our help around the world. And what you and I agree is the green energy transition. Wind, water, sun. So let me conclude there so we have enough time to go to Q&A. And I hope that I've said things you haven't heard before. I hope they've been informative. I hope they lead you to action. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, very much. Uh, uh, that was uh, unfortunately crystal clear. Um, it's there's so much information out there. It's a treat to hear your presentation, uh, where we get a, a very clear view of the stakes. Uh, going forward. Uh, before we take questions out of the chat, I just wanted to take uh, the chair's prerogative and ask a couple of questions, if I could, of you. Sure. Uh, and I would like to bring the discussion back to New Mexico. Uh, you know, it, it's we are an important player in the worldwide scheme that you outlined for us, uh, tactically, st strategically, economically, and in terms of our pollution footprint. I think you referenced the Stanford study that was just released uh, last week where they uh, did a basin-wide survey of the New Mexico Permian Basin and found this enormous multiplier on what we've been told was leaking. Um, so a couple of questions referencing that study. Uh, one, um, would you have any guess how much was spent on that study? They surveyed uh, upwards towards 30,000 wells. Um, and the reason I'm asking that is because the state of New Mexico is proposing to do a better job of regulating that same basin. And it was wanted to get a sense of the scale of that, that effort uh, just to understand what they're regulating or what that might be involved in that. Could you uh, comment on that? Um, to the extent that I'm ethically able to comment, I'll let you read between the lines there. I'm very familiar with the paper. Let's just put it that way. Um, the I don't know exactly how much money was spent on this study, but I can assert that it was many millions of dollars, many millions. The EDF study that I referred to that occurred over a period of about eight years cost over 30 million. Um, and if you look at the acknowledgements in this paper, 
uh, you'll note that there was <clears throat> the study was funded by the Stanford Natural Gas Initiative, an industry consortium. Exxon contributes $100 million a year to that consortium. So I was shocked, frankly, when I first saw this paper, which was long before it was published. Um, and if you read some of the comments by the authors along the lines of, we couldn't believe the number we were getting. We went back over again and again and again and repeated our experiments and repeated our measurements. We just couldn't believe the number was that high. It is. <laughs> and it costs many millions of dollars. So now you're asking, what would it cost the state of New Mexico? What would it cost the taxpayers in the state of New Mexico through regulation to try to find the super emitters? The paper says roughly 50% of the emissions they were measuring were coming from roughly a small percentage of the 30 some thousand facilities that they measured. So you first have to find those super emitters and they know where they are. <laughs> These people that did this study know where those super emitters are. So it sh shouldn't cost the taxpayers of New Mexico anything. It should just theoretically be a phone call. Send us your database. Tell us where your super emitters are so we can send our regulators out there, confirm your emissions and shut down that emission. Cheap. So the question isn't so much how much did it cost them to do this work. The question is, how much is it now going to cost the state of New Mexico to follow up on the work and shut down roughly 50% of these emissions quickly by finding the few hundred super emitters? Then the real work starts because the other 50% are coming from tens of thousands of locations. That's a long non-answer to your question, but, but I get the direction you were heading. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you know, we're uh, we're in a pitch battle uh, every year in the legislature to try to get more resources uh, to do what the politicians have acknowledged is necessary, which is to get the leak rate in New Mexico down to two percent of production by the year twenty twenty six. That's the commitment. Uh, under the old leakage understanding, 3.8%, 2% wasn't too ambitious. No, it wasn't. <laughs> but now, of course, we see that what they're laying out is enormously ambitious. So um, I think at this point, uh, is there, if there are other people that have uh, questions, uh, why don't you raise your hand? Uh, and uh, Tony, okay, 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 Michael, Michael? yes, um, yes, it seems to me that it's because it's very hard to get exactly precise measurements which people seem to want for the amount of leakage we have and the volume that we so called need that's in air quotes it, it, to satisfy current standards of life. In other words, if people are using the methane to generate electricity or they're using it to heat their homes, then we assume that that's needed for to maintain this kind of quality of life. So my big question is, is there a way we can rapidly transform the way we're living so we don't need the methane in the first place? Are there any solutions to that problem? Thank you for the question. It's a key question. It's an excellent question. And it's one that I personally <laughs> have been researching and writing about since 2011. Um, 2013, we published a paper on how to get New York State completely off of fossil fuels not going to heat our homes with natural gas. We're not going to generate electricity with natural gas. We're not going to burn oil in our cars as gasoline. And two years later, we wrote a paper on how to get California to do the same thing. 
And so there's a, there's a prescription. You read those papers, and there have been many, many other papers like them since. There's a prescription for how to make that transition, the very important transition you're talking about. How do we go from where we are to where we need to be, from caveman burning shit to electricity for everything without disturbing the fundamental quality of life that we've come to accept? Yeah, that's the big problem. So I'll give you a specific example. I'm sitting in my home right now. <clears throat> this home is a net zero home. There is no natural gas coming into this house. In my garage is an electric vehicle. So there's no gasoline coming into this house. On the roof of the house, there's 15 kilowatts of PV. We produce more electricity than we need. So it is certainly technically feasible. <laughs> if you're starting from scratch and building a new home or a new business, a new commercial enterprise, a new subway store, a new Walmart, <laughs> you can make them energy independent. Uh, yeah. But so what the question is, is how, do you, how do you scale that up? And how, yeah, do you do it in, how do you do it in an affordable way? Not right. everybody can afford to start a new house from scratch so that it is net zero. Or so that's, 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 the, that's really the problem. It's, it's, the technology is there. It's the financial wherewithal which includes incentives to do it, disincentives to not do it. And now we're getting into the economics, which obviously has a lot to do with changing patterns of social behavior. And in that area, I am not expert. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, maybe as a, 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 an additional comment, would you, are you familiar with uh, Bill McKibben's proposal of a few weeks ago about how we could export technology. Air, air source heat pumps. Yes. Sure. I, 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 talk, I talk to Bill frequently. Yes, I knew. So, so, so yeah, he he's, I, I alluded at the very end of my talk about what we should do instead of shipping more liquefied natural gas, that we should be sending boatloads of high efficiency appliances especially heat pumps to Europe. And I should point out, again, this is, this is down in the technical weeds. It would take me a couple minutes to explain why. But when you burn stuff, when you burn gasoline or burn petroleum or burn natural gas, you do that to create heat. And then you turn that heat into some form of energy mechanical energy in an internal combustion engine, heat energy in your house, heat energy to boil water, to dry your clothes, right? That's a very inefficient process. Burning something to get something else from the heat that you generate by burning it is lossy. It's inefficient. Using electricity to do the same things is usually three to four times more efficient. I'll give you an example. If I, heat, if I heated this house with a 100% efficient natural gas furnace, if when we built the house I'm in, we had put a traditional 100% efficient natural gas furnace, rather than the air source heat pump that we're using to both heat and cool the house, The air source heat pump is 300% efficient. It's three times more efficient than burning natural gas to heat the house. The car I'm driving is an electric vehicle. The car I had before was an internal combustion engine vehicle. The internal combustion engine vehicle converted 25% of the energy in the gasoline to move the car. My electrical vehicle, my electric vehicle is 80% efficient. It's three times more efficient than the previous car I had. So the point here is when we go to the aid of the Europeans and we help them with the electrification for home heating in all its forms, 
in commercial heating in all its forms, in industrial heating in all its forms. By going to electrification, the total amount of energy needed in Europe drops substantially. You need less total energy because all those things are much more efficient. You can't get that out of reading a New York Times article. <laughs> that, that's technically correct, but it's very hard to explain. Even now, I'm waving my hands. You'd have to take my word for it, but it can be proven. <laughs> it's thermodynamically correct, what I said. Jim, if you don't mind, I'd like to go to a couple of questions from the chat. Yeah, I'm working on that, Tom. Oh, are you? you yeah. do that? Okay. Uh, so, Tom uh, Singer, are you on? I feel Jim, yes, I am. I'm sorry. I'm a little slow on the draw here. Thank uh, you. I see you had a question in the chat. Would you go ahead? Well, you know, I just wanted to ask, Tony, thank you. I've been following your work for forever and been working on this stuff since the BLM methane rule of about 2014. Um, so, you know, we're doing our thing with government regulation and we know the challenges there. Have you been following the move to um, differentiate uh, com gas com as a commodity and the responsibly sourced gas movement? And do you have any thoughts about how we might undermine the ability of, of companies to claim that their gas is clean? Okay, I think there's two parts to your question. I don't know <laughs> anything about the first part, but as far as um, responsibly sourced gas, um, back in the 2008 to 2012 era in New York State, you might not know this, but New York State was targeted like Pennsylvania and West Virginia and mm -hmm. Ohio for development of shale gas. That rock you see behind me, that's Marcella Shale. So during that period, New York was being targeted. And typically, you drive down a road around where I live, and on the side of a barn, you'd see a sign that says, pass responsible gas. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. The point you was, see. they were saying there's such a thing as responsible gas. And then in about 2013, there was an organization formed in Pennsylvania. I Don't push me. I can't remember the exact name of the organization. <laughs> but the Environmental Defense Fund, working with the uh, Shale Gas Coalition in Pennsylvania, put together a set of principles for responsibly sourced gas. In other words, they wanted to have a certification program, just like ANSI, American National Standards Institute, or the International Standards Institute. There would be a set of standards that all companies would adhere to so that while they were producing shale gas, they would do it responsibly. And so they made a big fanfare out of this. It was on the front page of the New York Times, you know, responsibly sourced gas organization forms, asking companies to sign up and commit to do responsibly source gas. One year later, one company had signed up. At that time, there were about 600 operators in, New in Pennsylvania, 600. One signed up. So it died. So now what I'm seeing is it's coming back again. Uh, you know, for all the reasons I said, we need to start pumping out as much shale gas all across the country as he can. Once again, people like you and me are saying no, no, no. And once again, the people who want to do it are saying, yes, we can do it responsibly. So I reviewed for the Sierra Club the proposed regulations for certification. So here you had a battle between the Environmental Defense Fund and the Sierra Club. <laughs> the Environmental Defense Fund was saying, they, we can help people produce gas responsibly. And the Sierra Club was saying, oh, we're not so sure. <laughs> so they asked me to review the proposed regulations and I did, and they were, they were junk, they were crap. In many cases, they were, they were less restrictive than the regulations already on the books. So it, it's fanfare, it's greenwashing, it's public relations, it's advertising, but it's not real. What is responsibly sourced shale gas or responsibly sourced shale oil? What does that mean? 
that it's not going to be burned, <laughs> that there's going to be zero leakage, that there's not going to be any environmental impact whatsoever. What does it mean? What, what define responsible? Thank you. Uh, is Mark Schaefer still on with us? Uh, Mark had a question. There are a lot of good questions I'm seeing here. I wish we yeah. had time. Well, do you want to pick, you want to grab one? You can do that as well as I can. Yep. Sharon, are you on? Yep. The one I wanted to I ask. am. I answered one of Mark's questions about good. flaring, you know, and the covert venting. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Okay. I think Mark, Mark is there. I had another, the, the, the question to state it uh, was, there's been a push to uh, regulate um, flaring of natural gas, which seemed to me to create an incentive to vent it, which would be uh, orders of magnitude worse um, for the climate. Um, and uh, we, we, Jaron said, Yes, that's correct. My, my next question is, I saw a report this week um, that uh, looked, used satellite observation of uh, methane releases. And uh, if I remember correctly, the biggest uh, sources were the Permian, Russia, and the third location, I don't recall, maybe uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, but uh, part of that report indicated that uh, coal extraction actually was the biggest source of methane release uh, from uh, fossil extraction altogether. Uh, do you have you seen that report? Do you concur with that? I, I'm sorry, I, I, can't, I can't hear what's being asked. It's too, it's too low. I, I heard something about uh, sources. Is this better? Yeah, that's a lot better. What was it? Can you? What okay. was the question? Yeah, I saw. I think he's board. asking about coal bed methane releases. Okay. Um, so, is the question how significant are they? Yes. Yeah. Very significant. <clears throat> um, so, there was one other slide I was going to show. Well, I won't. It's it, it's a picture that came out of a paper that was published a few weeks ago. Uh, based on satellite measurements that co-located the most egregious methane emission sites um, and correlated them with pipelines and also correlated them with other things like coal bed methane. Uh, there's a lot of that, for example, in Australia. And as you know, uh, in New Mexico and Colorado. Um, and so one of the papers that I was involved in about six or seven years ago was one of the first uses of overflights. We had a scientist from Purdue uh, who had a private plane and who had great interest in this issue of methane emissions. And so we decided to do a um, focus study on one county in southwestern Pennsylvania. Now you might not know this, but Pennsylvania used to be a big coal producing state. So the anthracite region was the northeast of Pennsylvania. The bituminous region was in southwestern Pennsylvania. And in the bituminous region, there were all underground coal mines. So southwestern Pennsylvania is also the site of most of the Marcellus and Utica shale development. So you have tens of thousands of new wells puncturing through coal beds and also puncturing through old coal mines. And what we found then is that as they were drilling a new shale gas well and they poked through a coal bed and an open coal, met, coal bed mine, there was a huge emission of methane from the well while it was being drilled. First observation. Second observation, I published a paper two years ago uh, about emissions from all oil and gas wells in the state of Pennsylvania, including coal bed methane wells. And by far, 
per well, the largest emission source was coal bed methane by far. In some years, the emissions from a relatively few hundred coal bed methane wells in Pennsylvania exceeded the emissions from all the shale gas wells in the state of Pennsylvania. So yes, emissions from coal mining and from coal mine venting and from coal bed methane development are all significant. And to my best knowledge, no one has really yet done a comprehensive study on all those sources related to coal. Excellent question. Uh, if I could quickly add, uh, in New Mexico, when the methane bubble over the San Juan region uh, was studied in a yep. NASA NOAA study in 1998, the two largest point sources of methane emission, the first one was a leaking pipeline, mm -hmm. and the second one was the San Juan uh, coal mine. That, yep. that, and so uh, other states uh, have made attempts uh, to capture the methane coming out of uh, Colorado had a pilot project. I'm not sure where it went, but this is a huge problem uh, across the country. Yes. Yeah. Jim, uh, Ashok uh, Gush has had his hand up for a little bit. Uh, okay. We could recognize um, Ashok. Hi, uh, Tony, this is Ashok here. Um, I'm with the New Mexico Solar Energy Association. Can you hear me? Yes, hi Ashok, how are you doing? Doing okay, yes. I have a question, I know that you are an expert with the fracture mechanics, so, and I also, uh, you know, with the civil engineering, structural engineering, and now I'm mechanical. But my question is, um, when you do this hydraulic fracturing, do you also, there's also, what are the chances of landslides or earthquake you know, that is associated with fracking uh, a site? How, how, how extensive or how one-to-one -one correlated? Yeah, uh, another excellent question. And it's, let me, let me summarize. There are two instances in which um, man-made earthquakes can occur as a direct result of oil and gas operations. Two instances. Um, up to this point, the largest man-made earthquakes that have been registered in the US and in Canada uh, have been due not to the so-called hydraulic fracturing process, but due to waste injection. So mm -hmm. as you know, when you stimulate a well, oil or gas well, you're injecting a relatively high volume of stimulation fluid. Okay. And you get back from that well, lots of what you put in it, but also you get what's called wastewater, natural waters that were in the rock formation. And those have to be disposed of. And typically, not always, but typically they're disposed of through what are called the EPA class two underground injection program. You find an old oil or gas well that's depleted and therefore has a lot of permeability available down the hole. And you inject your waste fluids down that depleted oil or gas well for permanent storage. And what they discovered first in Texas and then in Arkansas and then in Oklahoma, yeah. <laughs> where there's a lot of this waste injection going on, an increasing rate of low level earthquakes where they had had none for decades, they were getting a few every day and then at some point, the magnitude of the earthquake started going up and they went from 0.1 to 1, from 1 to 2, from 2 to 3. And I think the largest one in the U.S. is somewhere in the 4, 4.5 range, which is enough to do some surface damage and certainly enough to do underground damage. So that's one source of human-induced earthquakes from oil and gas operations, waste injection. The other is directly, to do, directly due to what's called fracking which in shale really isn't fracking, it's hydraulic stimulation. If you look at that rock behind me, mm -hmm. yeah. it's already fractured, that's Marcellus. <laughs> you don't have to fracture an already fractured rock. All you're trying to do is hydraulically stimulate all those natural discontinuities. Shales are sedimentary rocks. They have bedding planes, they have joints, they have faults. And you wanna get 
a fluid under high pressure into all those discontinuities, prop them open, and outflows the oil and gas. Um, but same thing, if you pump enough fluid under high enough pressure, you can generate lots of movements in that rock mass. And by definition, the movement of a rock mass is an earthquake. So the highest recorded earthquakes from direct hydraulic stimulation, to my best knowledge, have been in Canada, and they've been close to magnitude five. So the remaining scientific question that many geologists are working on right now, especially earthquake geologists, is how large a magnitude can we expect? So the magnitude of an earthquake depends upon how large a region you're slipping and how large the stress was across that region. And either due to hydraulic stimulation or waste injection, you are <laughs> stimulating relatively large regions that have high stress on them. So don't so be surprised. If, don't be surprised if in the future you hear about a, a 5.5 or a 6. But is it not true that uh, we've been hearing about it recently only, but this as what you said in you know, a West well, and that has been there for a long, long time is going on. But we are hearing about this earthquake uh, connected to fracturing only recently. So, but was it, it happening before or what happened recently? It, wa it was happening, but it wasn't happening at very high incidence rates and very high magnitudes. So I was waiting for the first earthquake from stimulation. I don't want to call it fracking from okay. hydraulic stimulation in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was developing shale gas well starting in 2004. They didn't have their first induced earthquake from stimulation until about four years ago. So what's happened from the early days of stimulating a shale formation, whether it's oil and gas in the Permian or mostly gas in the Marcellus, is that the industry has moved to ever increasing volumes of stimulation fluid. The industry itself says we're in our fourth generation of shale gas and oil wells, fourth generation. Generation number one is the laterals were a few thousand feet long and they were injecting two or three million gallons of stimulation fluid and injecting something like two or 300 pounds of sand for every foot. Fourth generation wells, which we're into now, the laterals are three or four miles long. They're injecting 20 million to 30 million gallons of stimulation fluid as opposed to two or three. And they're injecting propent with the fluid at the rate of about a ton and a half of sand per foot. So now, I'm, going to repeat, I'm going to repeat what I just said because I don't think anybody heard it. Yes. If you heard it, your, your chins would be on yeah. the floor. You can't yeah. believe that somebody's going to inject 30 million gallons of frac fluid into a well that's three miles long. And while you're doing that, pump down 100,000 tons of sand. So mm -hmm. the likelihood that you're going to get an earthquake, a human-induced earthquake, from a three-mile-long well where you're injecting 30 million gallons of fluid is much higher than if you had a 2,000-foot lateral and you're only injecting 2 million gallons. So I think that's contributing to the increased rate at which we're seeing hydraulic stimulation induced uh, earthquakes and we're seeing higher magnitudes, which is why but, I'm predicting that we're gonna see bigger ones. But is it not true that you are expert with the fracture mechanics? So you sh is it not true that you can also predict that how much fluid they should be they should inject so that there will be no uh, what you are saying you know is it not possible looking at the formations and all <laughs> yeah but that goes against the economics what, what they're showing what the industry is determining going from generation one to generation four is that if you want high initial productivity from your well oh. if you want high initial it's called ip initial production the longer the well the more fluid you inject, the more profit you use, the higher the initial production. Okay. Hmm. How do you sell? How do you get a loan from Wall Street for a well? Hey, if we drill this well that's three miles long and we inject 30 million gallons of fluid, 
we're going to get really huge production and high profitability. Loan us the money. Okay. So right. yeah, what you're asking is somebody, the industry has smart people, smarter than me. They can figure out what the edge, <laughs> the envelope of safety is before yeah. they start triggering earthquakes. Yes. But until somebody really complains, until somebody says, stop it. So some states now have this uh, yellow, green, red light situation. You know, we monitor if you're only going to get a one or a two, that's a yellow light. Otherwise, it's green. You don't get a red light, which means stop until you get up to a magnitude three. England did the same thing while they were experimenting with hydraulic stimulation. Oh, nice. Thank so you. When, we, when we finally get a big one that causes a lot of damage and God forbid some some human injury, then maybe there will be even tighter regulations. But in the meantime, profitability rules. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, uh, Bruce, are you still on? Uh, you have your hand up for a little bit. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, I just want to uh, raise an issue, uh, Tony, having to do with electrification and uh, we get confused between site energy efficiency and source energy efficiency. And I think it's unfortunate we do. You were using the example of, for example, a heat pump compared to if I run uh, my boiler or furnace off natural gas, you made the comment that if the electrification, if I use the heat pump, it's electrification is 300% efficient. That's not true you have to consider where that electricity comes from. If you look at the standard grid, we have relatively small portions of renewable energy and some nuclear, but it's by and large fossil fuel. Every one of those power plants is like 30, 35% efficient. And so if you carry it back to the source, it's not 300 efficient at all. It's more like you, yeah, you lose not, yeah. that comparison, yes, a COP of a heat pump is like three or four. And that's compared to electric resistance heating at your 300 efficient. But you have to look at where that energy comes from. And as you said, your 15 kilowatt uh, PV, yeah, that applies, that's correct. You're getting uh, more efficiency there than you do with natural gas, for sure. But most people don't have 100% uh, site um, solar or wind. So you just have to keep, keep, to be honest, you have to be careful about that. You, you, the grid operates at um, um, something like 35, 40% efficient. And you pay for that if you look at the per unit of energy that you supply to your, your building. Uh, you um, pay for that, it's like three times as much as natural gas. Why? Because the grid operates on all those power plants that are running with fossil fuel at 35% efficiency. Okay, see what I'm saying? Yeah, I see what you're saying, but I don't think I was being deceptive because I specifically said in my house. Ah, yes. <laughs> In your house, I, you're right. I made, I made the point that not everybody has my house. Not everybody can have what I have in my house. Good. Well, I'm okay, glad. Okay. So what, what yeah. we're all, all talking about is to some degree aspirational. We have to move off of where we are. You are perfectly correct. In most states, in most regions in most states, the percentage of green electrons on the grid is not 100%. Exactly. So in upstate New York, where I live, it's about 80% green because we're mostly hydro. Thank God for Niagara Falls. <laughs> Thank God for Canada. Right. Most of the electricity on the grid where I live is hydro, base load hydro, mm -hmm. it's green. Right. But if you go downstate to New York City, okay, it's probably only maybe 30% yep. green. It's mostly yep. natural gas. So what you're saying there is, yeah, you have to take that into account. Yes, you do. But the whole idea is to move ahead. If we I, don't anticipate, sure, I totally agree. Before you the know. end of this decade, if we do not anticipate that before the end of this decade, 
electricity in all grids, in all states, in all regions of this country are nearly 100% green, we're lost. Okay. So there's no, reason to, there's no reason to dissuade people from moving ahead. If someone oh. right now has an aged boiler, a 75% efficient gas boiler heating their house, and it's about, and it just died, and they call their local plumbing and heating place, and the plumbing and heating place says, well, we can replace that with a high efficiency gas boiler, 95% efficient. Or if you want us to, we'll install a ground source heat pump or an air source heat pump. Um, it's gonna cost you more up front. What do you wanna do? What's the right answer? Heat pump. Thank you. <laughs> of course. We agree. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. It's just that I, I've heard that comparison before and yeah. it's just often not clear uh, yeah. the distinction there and we need to be very uh, careful about that. Good point. Thank you. Uh, so I think we've exhausted the people that had their hands up or maybe there's one more. No, Tony, do you... I'm my hands up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hi, Michael. Uh, yeah. Uh, just uh, thinking about the war between Russia and the Ukraine and not being able to send Russian gas and oil through Ukraine to Europe. Okay, so they're, they could potentially be starved from that energy resource and they're gonna have to do something quick. But here's the question. Okay, make it so Europe doesn't need Russian oil real fast. What does Russia do with what they have? They make more warplanes or they make more other stuff. You know? Or they sell it to China. Or whatever, but the point is, they're not being hurt by that loss of an, an economic market because of the way their economic system functions. They can just very quickly reroute things to doing what's needed next, you know? Uh, you know, with all due respect, I, I think uh, that geopolitics is a, is a, a whole uh, that we maybe should uh, <laughs> save for another time. I mean, I love, I love talking about it. I said it was yeah. a mess. Yeah, yeah. It, it is. And, and you know, I, I don't think we should ignore it on the one hand, because we have to think about uh, the strategy for long term involves how, how are things going to turn out? We have to think about what the ramifications are of the existing ongoing scenarios. What's going to happen if, you know, and if we don't do that, how can we plan for the future in any possible reasonable way? <laughs> well said. Hey, uh, Jim, if I could represent one of the couple of the questions on the chat sure. Uh, sure, related Tom. to biogas. And uh, so there are various sources of biogas and various claims about how good or bad they are. Maybe uh, Dr. Ingrafia could weigh in on your opinion of biogas as a source. I, I would if I were expert in that area, but I'm not but I would strongly recommend that at some point in the future, you invite my colleague, Bob Howarth, to talk to your group because he is expert in that area. Uh, if I remember correctly, he chaired a very significant study by the National Academy of Sciences uh, on the pros and cons of biogas. Um, certainly in New York state right now, where like many states, including New Mexico, we're trying to implement new rules and regulations, and in fact, a law uh, to make the state green. Uh, a point of contention is biofuels and all their source, all, and all their varieties. Um, so again, I, I'm, not, I'm just not expert in the area, but Bob is, so think about inviting him. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That uh, so, Tom uh, and uh, everyone, I think we're getting close to the end of our Q&A. Uh, Tom, you said you had another uh, question out of the chat. You want to, maybe that should be there the were, last. There were two questions about biogas. There's a recent one that uh, comes up often, which is um, how much energy goes into producing solar panels and wind turbines, and what about all of that and the exotic metals. And so that's a that is a frequently raised point. Um, I know that answer, but uh, we'll maybe let Dr. Ingrafia speak to that. 
I point to the scientific literature where there are many papers, some of them very recent, that look at the life cycle, energy, total energy cost of wind energy and solar energy. That is from the time you have to go mine whatever it is you need to make that wind turbine, concrete, steel, composites, glass, silicon, <laughs> aluminum frames, construction, manufacturing, shipping, installation, life use, recycling, that's the life cycle. And so again, that's not something that I am expert in. I read the papers. Um, I don't think that any one paper is now pointed to as that's the one that nailed it for either wind or solar. Um, can say the same thing about all other green forms of energy. Okay, so you wanna, you, you wanna use a hydroelectric dam to produce base load hydro? How much concrete went into that dam? As you know, cement production is very CO2 intensive. Okay, there are other economic, uh, there are other environmental impacts of that dam that have to be accounted for. So you have the environmental life cycle, you have the ec economic life cycle, and God knows you have a political life cycle for all these things. Uh, but you can't ever convince me that the life cycle of natural gas, from the time the first bulldozer shows up on a sand hill in south, wet, southeastern New Mexico to the time that methane and that oil goes to somebody in Europe, that the life cycle impact, environmental impact of that is better than the life cycle of solar or wind. You will not convince me of that. I just don't believe it. Well, that's maybe a, a good, a good uh, spot to uh, stop on. Uh, I think um, I, if we were all in person, uh, we would be clapping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bravo. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate much. the virtual clap. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I would like to uh, also thank the New Mexico Solar Association for co-sponsoring uh, this evening and for everybody whose uh, help has made it very successful. Uh, for your information, we will post the video of this presentation on the 350 uh, newmexico.org uh, website. It'll be up tomorrow. Um, thank you all. Thank you all for coming. It's been a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you again. Thanks for the Thank privilege. Awesome. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Really, really enjoyed it. <laughs>